Hi, my name is Annie Quintana Eddins. I'm the head youth leader and interviewer with the Lab Learning Action Buffet and a member of the Lab's Radio Hour production team. Today, our guest is Gila Solomon. Welcome and thank you for agreeing to talk with us today as part of our Youth Voice Matters and Voices of DACC project. This project captures the voices of Donia Community College students. It provides the space for them to tell their stories, share their hopes about the future, concerns, and or ideas to positively impact our community. Thank you for being willing to share your words with us today. And doing so, you encourage other students to use their voice. First, tell us a little bit about yourself and who you are. Where were you born? Where did you grow up? Et cetera. So I was born in Evergreen, Colorado, and then eventually moved to Southern Ontario, where I spent the majority of my childhood and young adult years. Um, I graduated high school and went to culinary school and then worked as a chef in fine dining restaurants for the last 10 years. And then when the pandemic hit, I decided I was ready for a change and decided to move to New Mexico to live with my grandfather and go back to school. Nice. Where did you go to culinary school? It's called the Stratford Chef School in Stratford, Ontario. That sounds like a a very um, cool kind of education experience. I I know someone who also went to culinary school and it's very much a mix between kind of like nutrition science and also like you're an artist at the same time. Yeah. My school is very, very intense. They try to mimic what it's like to actually work in a restaurant. So we work like 18 to 20 hour days in school and we ran real services in three different restaurants during the time we were there. Wow, that sounds intense. It, it was. <laughs> Fun, but intense. Yeah. <laughs> so what are some of your hobbies and interests? Um, I love to sing, and I play guitar, ukulele, and piano, and I love to read. Awesome. So um, you're, you're a musician. How did you kind of learn um, all these instruments? I started piano when I was nine uh, and did that for about seven years. And I didn't love like taking piano lessons. It wasn't super, I didn't like just like learning a piece of music and just playing it over and over. It was kind of boring. And then when I was in high school, I did a advanced music theory class, which I thought I was going to fail the entire time I was in it. Um, But I didn't. And I learned a lot about how to transpose music and use cording to play piano. And that allowed me to play and sing at the same time more easily. And that really like sort of sparked my interest in that. And then when I was about 18, I decided I wanted to teach myself how to play the guitar. And so I did that. And then ukulele is pretty easy to add on once you can play guitar. The theory is similar. You just have different chord structures. That's, um, that's really amazing that, um, you kind of latched onto the theory side of music and that's how you kind of grew. Um, I feel like that's very um, um, atypical because um, theory is hard. I, I played the cello from the time I was like 11 to 21. Um, and uh, yeah, the theory part was always the hardest part uh, to get for my brain because it's a lot of math kind of basically. <laughs> I don't know that I like am an expert by any means, but I learned just enough to make what I do possible. That's really cool. So can you tell us a little bit like about your major, your area of study? You sound like a very well-rounded person in um, what you do, but what is your major in school now? I am doing gender studies. So I uh, have a plan. My current plan is to eventually do something in diversity training and change management. So my goal is to get a master's in gender studies and then go from there. I've only ever taken one gender studies class and I absolutely loved it. It's incredibly relevant to just about everything. Mm -hmm. So um, that's, that's really neat. What kind of um, 
within gender studies, what's kind of your main um, interest and focus? I mean, I would say just fighting for gender equality. And, um, you know, I really stand in the world for inclusivity and making people feel safe and allowing them to be exactly who they are in the moment. That's really where my, my passion lies. It took me a long time to, to get to the place where I was ready to dive into that fully, but I'm, I'm happy to be doing it now. Well, I just want to say thank you for doing that work because that's hard work um, for sure as a woman in the world and fighting for inclusivity. So thank you for doing that. Um, can you also tell us a little bit more about what you'll be sharing with us today and how this came to be, this work? Sure. So today I'm going to share with you a poem that I wrote uh, sort of offhandedly as part of an optional English assignment. And I kind of completely forgot about it. And then my instructor reached out and asked if I wanted to share it with all of you. And I said, sure, why not? <laughs> So it is, uh, it's called The Hare. The Hare, the jackrabbit, legendary, scarce, unafraid, but cautious. Strong and unpredictable, you sit quietly, one with the scrub brush. You contemplate survival, sitting still, watching, twitching, waiting. Then a moment full of action. When danger comes, you rise, bounding, bouncing, twisting through the air. You evade, escape, disguise. And reach astounding heights and hide in plain sight to stay alive. I love it. Thank you for sharing your poem with us. <laughs> Thanks I feel that. like that is a very um, place specific and um, unique um, poem. I'm uh, in school. I am a geographer. Uh, that's my, my area of study, uh, specifically human environment relationships. And in this, there's a new um, kind of wave in geography called literary field guides, where they kind of take on the position of an animal or of a plant and kind of tell their story. And I feel like that was a little what you just um, described for us. How, yeah. Where did your inspiration come for this poem? Uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the author, but we had to watch a video of a woman who wrote a poem called Ode to a Rat because she was told by a professor to write about what she knew. She was from Brooklyn, New York. And so she wrote a poem from the perspective of rats in Brooklyn. And uh, so I was like, oh, well, what's nearby? <laughs> and I've always loved rabbits. And I have this really great memory of driving through uh, Truth or Consequences at night one time and the rabbits were just like hopping out of the way of the car and you could like, I must've seen a hundred of them in like a five minute period, just like jumping out of the way of the lights. And uh, I, I don't know, that was kind of my inspiration for the <laughs> description of the action of a rabbit. For sure, oh my goodness, that must've been quite a memory. Yeah, all those rabbits jumping. Yeah, I was in the car with a friend and she said, I've never seen a jackrabbit. And then two seconds later, a hundred of them. <laughs> she called them there yeah they, they were called <laughs> you chose to write this um poem um for this class what made you go for the optional um kind of assignment it was it that you just really wanted to write a poem based off of this other poem uh I was inspired by the poem that we watched and responded to and then you know I had time and then I was finished with the rest of my homework that day and thought, oh, yeah, I could write a poem. <laughs> For sure. In gender um, studies, you kind of have to do a lot of writing, right? So I think I'm just finishing my first semester, so I haven't gotten too deep into it yet. Okay. I was going to say, because, like, English, I, I'm sure, like, uh, more, like, work in English classes will translate very well into gender study classes. It's the same skills, yeah. That's, that's one of the things I remember from my, the one class I took um, at NMSU. And I really wish I remember which class it was, um, but I don't remember. It was during um, 
online virtual school during the pandemic. So um, it was all online and it was a lot of reading and a lot of writing, but it was just so relevant to every other subject that I was um, studying. And I, I enjoyed it so much. And um, I think the, um, the goal of getting your master's in that field is going to be, um, I don't know, I, I very much support people getting their, their master's. Um, it's a hard process, but I'm, I'm in it right now. But, um, but it's a great process. You learn a lot about yourself. Yeah, I, I just decided if I was going to go to school, I may as well go all the way to at least a master's. <laughs> Ew. Side past that. <laughs> yeah. A bachelor's in gender studies may not get me very far either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, that's the way the education system's gone, right? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So um your you had described kind of your your goal is wanting to um encourage inclusivity um and provide space for everyone to feel comfortable going into the future. What are, what do you think are some ways that other people can, can do that in the community? Uh, the thing I always tell people is just to be willing to have a conversation about it. If somebody, if you know someone who's changing their pronouns or uh, something like that, ha have a conversation with someone who may not want to talk about it. Like, Hey, how would you, how do you feel about this? Like be willing to have the difficult conversation because within that container, people are able to learn and grow. And I think that it's ignorance and fear that creates most of the danger in our society today. And so just being willing to talk about it. And if someone tells you their pronouns and you have questions for them, be willing to ask them questions too. Cause it's not going to like, that's not the problem. It's okay to ask questions so that you understand and are able to be more inclusive. That, that's very well said. Um, it, it is a lot of fear and um, I think, yeah, uncomfortable conversations. No one wants to have uncomfortable conversations, but they're just uncomfortable because we uh, kind of tell ourselves they are, right? Um, I've, been, I've been doing this experiment through another course I've been doing about sort of sitting down and trying to have conversations with people of all ages, talking about gender equality, what that, what they think that means, what their response when they hear that is. And what I really learned is that even if you don't agree, you can still have a really interesting conversation. And even if it's a small amount of knowledge that's gained on either side about what's, what's happening in people's minds, I think it's a ripple effect that will help over time. It's not a huge action, but it's a small one that anyone can do. Yeah, our ideas of gender um, and um, inclusivity and um, rights have definitely changed over the years. So um, learning what the older generations or the younger generations are thinking about it, I'm sure provides so much more insight and it's just like thought provoking, I'm sure. Um, I'm, I would be really interested in in talking with people I know from all different ages within my family about, about that. That's a really great idea and, and something practical that some people could do in their lives if they, if they wanted to learn a little more. Mm -hmm. One thing I've really noticed is a lot of times older people, they're not necessarily uh, bigoted in any way. It's just a lack of understanding. So even just, giving them the opportunity to ask questions in a really low stress way can change the way that they behave and that could save somebody's life. That, that is a beautiful thing. Um, and certainly something that we need right now. Um, and in our state, because um, I feel like there's a lot of, um, I don't know, our education system within New Mexico we are consistently lowest in, in the country. And um, we, <laughs> I think that lack of knowledge and um, kind of critical thinking stems out past um, just like school um, and into our communities. So if we can start stimulating those kinds of conversations outside of schools um, and within the greater population, maybe that'll, that will save lives and make people feel much more 
a part of the community rather than creating all these margins. Absolutely. Well, um, is there anything else you would like to share with our audience today? I don't think so. I think that's it. Wonderful. Well, um, I want to thank you so much for being with us today and sharing your time, your words, and your voice. Um, we had a few technical issues, but I'm so glad that we worked them out because this has been absolutely wonderful talking to you and learning more about you. Um, and we look forward to continuing our collaboration with Donia Community College. And for our listeners today, please visit the lab website, lablc.org, to be a part of our community. We encourage you to keep speaking out and to join the conversation. Your voice and positive call to action makes a real difference in the world now and in the future.